Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, this is our second, um, second session of our webinars series. Um, today we are talking about uh, soil salinity with one of our contributors, contributors Ross McKenzie. Um, he's a retired soil and crop research scientist previously with Alberta Agriculture and Forestry. Uh, we'd like to take the time to thank our sponsor, Bioagronics. Bioagronics has been working on Western Canadian soils close to 40 years. When Bioagronics started back in 1979, the focus was on land reclamation with oil companies on saltwater spills. Reducing farmland salinity can be accomplished with the Bioagronics program in a timely and cost-effective manner. The solutions developed can address marginal land to the most severe. Salinity is manageable with soil Soil Smart Solutions. Visit, bi visit bioagronics.com to learn more. Um, and again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, just a reminder that this webinar will be recorded and made available to all registrants approximately 24 hours after our live presentation. Um, Ross, again, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Um, he's been a regular contributor to Top Crop Manager for five years now. Um, just a reminder also, um, this webinar is approved for one CCA and one CCSC CEU continuing education um, credits. Um, you will receive um, a follow-up email approximately 24 hours after this presentation, and you can email in your name and number, and we will get those credits to you guys. Um, Ross, if you'd like to take it away. Okay, well, thanks very much for the kind introduction and uh, welcome to everyone to, for joining our webinar today titled uh, Effects of Root Zone Salinity on Crop Growth and Production. So, uh, in terms of introduction and what I want to, want to talk about uh, for the next uh, hour or so is really what I'd like to talk about what soil salinity really is in terms of being a salt affected soil. How do we diagnose soil salinity? How does it affect soil and how does it affect crops? What are the causes? What actually causes the uh, saline soils to develop? And what are the potential management uh, options? So in terms of introduction then, I like to make sure that everybody's aware there are different types of salt affected soils. The one we're really gonna focus in on today are saline soils or soil salinity. And these are just uh, soils that have a high enough level of soluble salts in the soil to impair crop growth. And when we really have severe soil salinity, we'll actually see uh, weight salt uh, on the actual soil surface as in this picture. But we do have other types of salt affected soils. For example, uh, one that's relatively common in Western Canada are sodic soils. Uh, when we actually classify them, they're actually uh, classified as solenetic soils typically. And these soils have a, a high level of exchangeable soil. And that's a particular salt in the soil that can very negatively affect soil structure and can also affect crop growth and yield. And we actually look at a, a profile of the soil, solenetic soil, we'll actually find this B horizon below the top soil has a columnar structure and the surface of the uh, soil aggregates is coated with sodium and it actually gives it a, a kind of a dark or even black sheen when it's uh, black or when it's wet. So we do have different types of salt affected soils and one of the best ways to really identify them rather than trying to use visual methods, especially when they're not severe, is laboratory analysis. And most soil testing labs will do uh, a measurement called electrical conductivity to determine if your soil is becoming uh, saline. And uh, the abbreviation sometimes is used as EC. So when you look at on your cell test report, you might not see electrical conductivity, but you might see an EC ra rating or a number. And that's what you really want to look at. Uh, for sodic soils, there's two different analysis that can be used in the lab. One is called sodium absorption ratio, or the acronym for it is SAR, or the other is exchangeable sodium percentage, or ESP. So we do have different types of lab analyses that can be used to identify different types of salt affected soils. The one we're gonna be most interested in uh, from a salinity standpoint is electrical conductivity. And really all we're doing is trying to measure the amount of soluble salts in the soil. So for example, a farmer would take soil samples in an area that he thinks is affected by salinity, uh, maybe a marginal area and a good area and have those analyzed in the lab. What the lab will do is grind those soil samples, then allow distilled water to these soil samples and just bring them up to becoming a saturated paste to let them equilibrate overnight. And then the, the next day they will extract that uh, water, literally suck the water out of that sample. And then that extract is tested to see how much electrical current will actually 
be conducted by that ext extract. The uh, more electricity that sample will conduct, the more salt you actually have. The units that are usually used in the, by the lab are, you see, you see down here where it says small d capital S slash M, that stands for deci siemens per meter. Uh, now, most people don't really care what those units are, but that's just simply a measure of electricity. And the greater this number, the greater the salinity problem. So, so as soon as you see the number two, that would indicate you have a slight salinity problem. The higher the number, uh, the greater the uh, salinity problem you actually have. Now, for uh, sod uh, sodic soils, one of the analysis we use is a uh, sodium absorption ratio. And really, in this case, we're really interested in the amount of sodium in the soil as we want to determine the concentration of the sodium in the soil compared to calcium and magnesium. And then there's a, a more complex formula we use to calculate the ratio of sodium compared to calcium and magnesium. And when that level is greater than 12, then that soil is classified as being sodic. But to be honest, when I see numbers of SAR in the range of even two to four, already I'm getting concerned because an SAR of four can start to affect uh, soil structure. So those lab analyses can be very meaningful in, in terms of interpretation and helping to decide how, what kind of a problem you have and how it should be managed. Now this just comes from a publication uh, we wrote a few years ago just showing when the uh, SAR is less than uh, 13 and when the electrical conductivity is less than two, we would call that soil normal. But once your EC is greater than two, that soil will be classified as saline. When it's greater than 12 from the sodium absorption ratio, it'll be classified as sodic. And typically, a sodic soil is high in sodium, uh, will often have a very high pH. And whenever I see a soil with a high pH, I'm often thinking that that could potentially be a sodic soil. And if you happen to have a high EC and a high SAR, then that sort of soil will be classified as, as saline sodic, which is uh, going to cause a, a lot of problems. Now, we're going to focus on saline soils today, but I do just want to mention there are publications. This is now a publication that Dr. Shelley Woods and I wrote that's on the Alberta Agriculture website on how to manage sodic soils. But really, for the rest of the day, we're going to focus on uh, saline soils. But I just will talk about one term, alkali. I can remember when I was a kid back in the 60s, old farmers would talk about the white patches in their field. And they would refer to them as alkali. And this, still, this term is still being used, and it's an incorrect term to refer to saline soils. So when you see white patches in the field, those are saline soils. And when we talk about true alkali, that is really just an abbreviation for alkaline, which means the soil has a very high pH. And typically when you see a high pH, odds are it's a sodic soil, not a saline soil. So the term alkali referring to white salt affected soils is really not an accurate term. So the rest of the, the, the time we'll spend talking about soil salinity. And just to review then, it's just simply a soil has enough soluble salts to impair uh, crop growth. And when we actually measure the electrical conduct in the soil, usually it's going to be uh, above two. Now, one of the questions that comes up, what are the different salts that are in soil? And there's many different salts that are in soil. And for instance, just listed some here. This actually just comes from some uh, work done by Les Henry when he was at the University of Saskatchewan. So sodium chloride, magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, uh, sodium sulfate, magnesium sulfate, calcium sulfate, uh, calcium carbonate. There are all kinds of different uh, salts in the soil. But when we look at the solubility, some are actually quite soluble and therefore can really move with the water when they're in, in soil. But others like calcium sulfate, which is commonly referred to as gypsum, has a relatively low solubility. Others like calcium carbonate, which is lime, has an extremely low solubility. So these tend not to be the dominant salts that are going to move in soil. But these ones here would be the ones you typically find more commonly in uh, saline soils where you see the white patches in fields. Now, uh, how do soluble salts actually affect plant growth? Well, first of all, these soluble salts can actually be have a bit of a toxic effect on plants when they're in high concentration. I'm just going to back up for one minute and just point out that magnesium and calcium are required, macronutrients are required by plants for growth. Chloride is a micronutrient, sulfate is a macronutrient. I mean, in prairie soils, probably the third most efficient uh, nutrient in our soils typically is sulfate. And even sodium isn't normally uh, considered a nutrient, but for crops like sugar beets and corn, it is a required uh, uh, micronutrient. So these different salts are actually re required by, by crops for their growth, but when they're at a high enough level, it can actually be, have a toxic effect to plants. But the real problem is what we call salt effect. And typically when plants take up water, uh, the concentration of salts in, in the roots are greater than in the soil, and then water moves from the from the soil solution into plant roots just by uh, osmotic uh, pressure. 
but when we have higher levels of salts in the soil, that can really start to restrict the ability of the plant roots to actually take up water. So uh, the more salt we have in the soil, the more difficult all the more difficult it is for plants to actually take up water, causing stunted growth. And in the worst case, we can actually see water moving out of the plant cells and the plant roots back into soil, which then causes desiccation of the plant tissue, and then the plants will actually die in the worst case uh, situations. So how did the saline soils actually develop? Well, the, if you kind of think in Western Canada, the last glaciation receded 10 to 12,000 years ago. And over that 10,000 years, uh, we've had natural salinity of form and develop just through natural soil and groundwater uh, processes. But from about 100 to 150 years ago is when a lot of our agricultural lands were developed for uh, agricultural production. And that's when we started to see secondary salinity form. And that's soil salinity development or expansion as a result of human activities and farming practices. Farming practices have played a, a huge role, but even things like road construction has interfered with uh, things as well to cause uh, additional salinity problems. So here's a, a diagram that I'd like to spend a little bit of time on. Uh, it was actually from uh, Albert Air Culture. And if we just kind of look at a low relief or low slope position, uh, the X's show the saline seep and the dots show the soil particles. Really what happens for a saline soil to develop, you wind up with a water table fairly close to the soil surface, usually within one meter, but uh, sometimes even within two meters of the soil surface. And water, the groundwater will start to move up by a capillary action. The water uh, moves up in the you know, soil, small soil pore, so, sorry, the small soil pores draw that water up by capillary action. And then as the water reaches the soil surface, it's used by crops and, and evaporates, and then the salts are left behind. So really what we have then, water moving up close to the, the root zone, uh, the water moving up by capillary action, as the water is uh, used up by the crops or evaporates, salts are left behind. But the, what is the reason really for that high water table? Let me have to kind of go back up slope to see where did that really water, where did that excess water come from? And that's where we look at the, the recharge area. The upslope positions where because of current farming practices, excess water that wasn't being used by crops moves through the root zone, moves through the subsoil, and in that water dissolved salts are in our, in our uh, subsoils down to develop a water table over an impermeable clay layer or even bedrock in some cases. So we can have the development of a water table and then that water starts to move, the groundwater will start to flow to lower slope positions and where our salinity problems develop is when the water table is within one or even two meters of the soil surface. So where the excess water comes from is the recharge area, the area where the water leaves and leaves the salt behind is referred to as a discharge area. So just to kind of review then, uh, we have a lot of soluble salts that occur naturally in our subsoil. And when excess water moves through the subsoil, uh, those soluble salts will dissolve, move downward with the water to form a water table, and then our water starts to move. And that location is referred to as the recharge zone where the excess water comes from. Where the, the big concern is, is the discharge zone, and that's where the groundwater flows to lower topographic areas. So when the water table is within one or sometimes two meters of the soil surface, then we have this capillary action bringing water and salts up towards the, and up into the root zone towards the soil surface. As the water evaporates or is used by crops, the salts are left behind. And this takes period, um, many years to happen. We can talk about 20, 40, 60, even 80 years, depending on how far that water comes, uh, to actually create a, a saline soil. But the area that where the salts are left behind is referred to as a discharge zone. So just to kind of review then, um, first of all, we have to have a development of a water table at a low, in a lower, lower relief area typically within one or two meters of soil surface. And then that water moves up by capillary action up into the root zone, bringing the salts up, up into the root zone and towards the soil surface. And as water evaporates and is used by crops, the salts are left behind. And it takes many years for this process to actually cause the formation of saline soils. So really when we talk about the cause of salinity then really it's the cause is excess water. And so what happens is excess water is dissolving the salts it transports the salts into a lower relief or lower topographic areas, and then those salts become more concentrated as our water is evaporated or used by crops. So what is the cause of this excess water? Well, often in the recharge areas, it might be uh, summer fallow. It might be uh, just roads interfering with surface drainage and groundwater movement. It could uh, very well be just excess water in the spring before seeding or even after seeding 
in May and early June. No, that tends to be a fairly wet year across the prairies. Sorry, a wet time of the year across the prairies and we'll have excess water moving through the root zone when the crops are still at a fairly young seedling stage and not using a lot of water. Or after in the fall after the crop is harvested, when we have excess precipitation, we'll move through the root zone down into the groundwater. And then we tend to be growing more shorter season crops or shallow rooted crops like peas that don't grow for as long, don't use up as much water. So there's various reasons for that excess water. But sometimes salinity is uh, blamed on other factors like the use of fertilizers like chloride in the potassium chloride fertilizer 0060 or, or sulfate in products like 210024. But for the very, very small amounts of fertilizer we put on our land, that really has insignificant roles in, in contributing to soil salinity. And some people also blame salinity on herbicide use or fungicide use and impairing uh, uh, actions in, in the soil and causing our salinity on, on use of some of these uh, different agronomic products or even on use of larger farm machinery that might cause soil compaction. Uh, all of these are virtually insignificant in terms of contributing to soil salinity across the prairies. But uh, So we really have to look at the root cause and that's excess water and groundwater. Now dryland salinity is a major degradation problem across the Canadian prairies. Uh, this is information come from three uh, provincial provinces, prairie provinces, 1.6 million acres of land in Alberta, 3.3 million in Saskatchewan, 1.6 million in uh, Manitoba. And these would be just kind of looking at the severe and very severe. And in my opinion, these numbers are probably somewhat out of date. And Alberta is just not something that's measured by the, the Alberta government or by Alberta culture anymore. So what are some of the early indicators? Well, in discharge areas back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, prior to actually seeing white salt areas on the surface, farmers would report usually the, these areas were actually the better yielding areas in the field, which is not surprising. There was better moisture conditions before you had too much salt. So they were yielding better, but over time they would stay greener longer later into summer, and they would tend to stay wetter longer in the uh, uh, these areas will, will remain wetter longer when the rest of the field is dried up. So those are some of the things that would be kind of early indicators. But how do we actually recognize a saline soil? Well, when it's uh, severe, it's actually fairly easy to recognize with the white salts on the surface. But before it gets to that state, um, you might notice that the uh, plant growth is distressed, but that can be caused by many different factors. But typically that distressed growth would tend to be more on side slopes and uh, lower topographic areas. And if you drink dig carefully, uh, you might even see some salt crystals in old root channels or worm channels where salts are precipitated out of solution. And some of the giveaways then in these, these areas, you'd start to see growth of salt tolerant weeds like Russian thistle or foxtail barley or kochia. Those would be salt tolerant weeds that would be early indicators. And really, if you see distressed crop growth and, and you're kind of wondering, is it salinity? Well, the best way to really check then is to take soil samples from the worst area, the marginal area, and the good areas, and actually have them checked for electrical conductivity. And that will tell you if you have a salinity problem or not. And then if you do, then you can actually do more intensive investigations of the salts using machines like EM38 or Varus, and I'll talk about that more a little bit later. Now, one of the, th the terms I tend to use, and other, others that work in salinity use, is hidden salinity. When EC is between 2 and 8, there won't be any visible salt on the soil surface. But you will definitely have depressed crop growth. And uh, some crops are very sensitive, even at an EC of 2 or 3. For example, beans, you'll lose 30% of your yield potential when your EC is between 2 and 3. And But there's no visible salt on the surface. And so we really refer to this as hidden salinity. The crop isn't doing as well, but there's no obvious uh, signs of salt. And sometimes uh, that uh, might actually look like the crop is a bit uh, drought stressed from lack of water. And that's really what it is. A plant is having difficulty taking up water. Sometimes that the poor growth is blamed on not enough fertilizer or herbicide injury or root diseases. And these can be contributing factors, but the real problem is the, the salts in the soil that are, are um, negatively affecting the plant growth. Now, when we kind of look on the prairies and we go back to about 1900 to 1960s, the wheat fallow crop rotation was really probably one of the, the dominant cropping systems across the southern prairies. And uh, really when we had land in summer fallow every other year, that really contributed significantly uh, to excess water going down to the groundwater. And we just look at this picture, which was taken north of Lethbridge. You can see the white areas where there are salt showing up, and you see the, the alternating wheat fallow strips. But then you see other areas like this that are, are becoming saline, but they're not wet yet. 
I just took some data, some precipitation data from the uh, Lethbridge Research Center where I uh, worked for many years and just looked at the, the wheat fallow period the, when the land is actually in, in, in summer fallow, is actually 18 to 19 months, typically the crop is harvested in in uh, late August, early September, then you go through an entire crop year without anything growing. Then the following spring, uh, usually in uh, late April, early May, seeding takes place. So that, that fallow period tends to be about 19 to 20 months. And if you look at the precipitation that typically we would get in southern Alberta, that would be about 20 inches. But typically our soils tend to be loam to clay loam and typically we can hold about five to six inches of stored soil moisture. Uh, with a clay loam soil it's probably around six inches. So we get 20 inches of precipitation over that time period of 20 months but the soil can only hold six inches. That's about 30 percent of what we were received which basically means the rest of that moisture is lost. So some of it's going to evaporate uh, snow melt will evaporate or, or run off, some of that precipitation is going to run off or, ev or evaporate. So not all of this 14 inches is going to depercolate down into the, to the, the water table, but some of it will. And I would suggest that probably typically it's going to be at least four to six inches, which should be in a range of 20 to 30 percent of this uh, excess moisture is going to wind up uh, moving down to the, the water table. So the wheat fallow system really was quite detrimental to um, to raising the, the groundwater and the water table and causing and contributing to uh, the salinity across the southern prairies. So because of the way we farmed, we're using the wheat fallow system and excess water going down to the groundwater and contributing to the development of salinity, because of the way we farmed, this is really what we've wound up with over the last hundred years or so. Now I've talked about the EC and I really want to just sort of give you some readings. When, for the zero to 60 centimeter depth, if your soil is less than two, we consider non-saline, it really should be less than an EC of one. Between one and two, I'm starting to get worried, but once you're at two, um, then we call that weekly saline between two and four, uh, moderately saline between four and eight. But in this zone here, you're not going to see any visible salt on the soil surface. We really have to get up to between eight and 16 before we call it strongly saline. And then we're going to start seeing salts on the surface around somewhere around 10 or an EC of 12. Then once we're at uh, greater than 16, we call it very strongly saline, and that's uh, really when virtually nothing will grow. Now at the uh, Lethbridge Research Center, we uh, tended to run uh, a diagnostic fuel school for a number of years. Uh, that's We don't do that anymore. It's been taken over by another organization. But uh, there was a, a road was put through here, if any of you are familiar with the Lethbridge Research Center, just across the road on the south side of the secondary highway um, is where we did this uh, diagnostic field school. And a road was put in about uh, 20 years before we started putting these, these plots in for the diagnostic field school. And this little corner of the field, less than an acre, just gradually became saline over a period of years just because of this construction of this road. At this sign here, there's an EC of two. At this sign here is an EC of four. The very far end, the EC in this particular uh, strip is eight. And this is actually barley. Then we had peas and lentils and other crops seeded uh, across here. And just to demonstrate how the how the crop growth was affected by by uh, slight to moderate salinity. So an EC of two here will be just the beginning of the saline area. And you can see the growth is not bad. But very quickly, as you move from four to eight, it just uh, dribbles off with virtually no production by the time we get to an EC of eight. And different crops do have different levels of sensitivity. Special crops like potatoes and corn tend to be have a low sol tolerance for salts. Uh, some of our pulse crops, peas and beans, don't have a great tolerance for salt. Well seed uh, crops tend to be a bit uh, better. You see I have canola here. I also have canola listed under, under a higher tolerance. Typically we think the, of wheat and barley having the best tolerance of our annual crops. But the hybrid canolas actually have quite good tolerance as well. When we look at grasses, Timothy has a low tolerance, fescue grasses are moderate, and wheat grasses tend to be have a, a higher tolerance for salinity. And that just shows uh, the, the higher end uh, a little bit later on in the season of that particular uh, uh, diagnostic field school. This area in here had an EC of four to five. This is mustard, it was actually looking not bad. If you just kind of go back here, you, you can see just how the, the crop was declining in terms of its growth from one end to the other. Uh, potatoes did very, very poorly. By the time uh, we were at four to five, the potatoes were, you uh, wouldn't eat much potatoes from uh, if you had a field like this. 
Now there's some great work that has been done on looking at crops and different salinity levels by uh, Dr. Harold Stefoon when he was the uh, soil scientist at the uh, Swift Current uh, Research Centre in uh, Saskatchewan. He did some very interesting work where he looked at different uh, uh, types of crops. In this particular case, he was looking at cotepohydrate spring wheat, Kyle Durham, and Fielder was an old uh, soft white spring wheat variety bigger was a CPS variety and he had different levels of salinity he looked at a relative yield and, and he found it even at an EC of two he had already was losing 20% losing, uh, of yield production for the uh, hard red spring and the durum wheat but for the soft wheat and CPS wheats he things were actually doing a little bit better but usually at, by an EC of seven I'm not looking for much production at all for wheat but it did show that some varieties or types were doing better than others. He also did some interesting work with, with other crops, this particular variety. Uh, this is actually Harrington barley. We usually consider Harrington barley or, or barley in itself to be one of our, our most tolerant annual crops to salts. But when he compared it to Hyola canola and Invigor canola, you can see that the canola, the hybrid canolas, are actually doing better than the, um, than the, the, than the barley. So some of the newer canola types actually have a fairly good um, salt tolerance. But Really, when it comes to an ECS7, I really don't expect much production, and I think these numbers are probably you know, quite a bit better because they're in a lab compared to what you really have in the field. Uh, this was just a graph, or sorry, a chart that was put together by Les Henry when he was at the University of Saskatchewan, looking at two to six, uh, you see of two to six, six to 10, and then 10 to 15, just showing different uh, grass mixtures that he would have recommended uh, at different levels of salinity. So once you're at an EC, in my opinion, uh, uh, five and six by that time it's maybe time to stop growing annual crops and then looking at growing the uh, salt tolerant uh, uh, grasses. What I'd like to do now though is just spend a little bit of time talking about the different types of soil salinity and we have different types of salinity across the prairies based on soil characteristics, topography, our underlying soil and geological characteristics and hydrology and how groundwater actually uh, moves in an area. This is one of the more common types of salinity in Alberta and in Saskatchewan. That's called contact slope salinity. Typically on a lower slope position, we will see salinity developing. If we back up, and this might be two or three or 400 meters upslope, we have the recharge area in this area. It might have been a continuously cropped or in a wheat fallow system, but excess moisture was moving down, developing a water table over an impermeable or heavy clay layer. The, the, the development of that groundwater would move down slope above that impermeable layer. And then once that water table was within a, typically of a meter or sometimes even two meters of cell surface, then you get the upper capillary action moving salts with it. And often this distance might only be uh, uh, a few hundred meters or a kilometer. But as long as you can identify the recharge area and you change your cropping practices, that will and reduce the amount of excess water moving down to the water table which will reduce the water table here, then we can actually start combating this, uh, the salinity just using cultural controls. So this is a fairly common method or a common type of salinity on the prairies. Another one is um, a depression bottom salinity where are in glacial till soils. We have fairly rolling topography uh, in lower depressional areas, uh, depending on how we're cropping that land, if it's wheat fallow or any excess moisture moving down to the water table. Uh, raises this water table and then we have salinity development in the lower slope positions in the in the in the depression bottoms. Again another common type of salinity and sometimes these depressions are actually filled with water most of the year and then you get around these sloughs you have salinity developing and oftentimes we have more water in those sloughs now just because of the way we're cropping and there's more runoff and, and more water on the, in these depressions and then we get what was called uh, slough ring salinity. Uh, a common type of salinity that we used to have in southern Alberta was irrigation canal seepage. Most of our, our salinity in southern Alberta and irrigated areas was really from seeping canals, but by lining those canals and, uh, and the smaller canals being replaced by pipelines, we have virtually eliminated uh, salinity problems as a, as a result of the canal seepage in the last 40 years. But really what we have to do is get rid of that, that water source that's causing problems um, either on the other side of the irrigation canal bank or in some cases uh, two or three kilometers away from these seeping canals. But a very good job has been done to uh, rectify that in southern Alberta. Now one of the things I did mention is road construction. That's another another th activity, human activity that's interfered with uh, surface and groundwater and causing uh, salinity problems along roads. So when grid roads were, were built, uh, they were built with compacted clay and raised and oftentimes that would interfere with, uh, this would be the soil surface here, 
this would be the uh, the water table here, so it would interfere with uh, uh, groundwater movement. And oftentimes, we would also have water flow on the surface soil that would accumulate on the upslope side of the road. So we have a, an increase in uh, increase in the uh, water table close to the soil surface, and as a result, we get uh, salinity form. But you can even in these borrow pits on either side of the road, uh, sometimes water will sit for extended periods of time, develop a water table, and we'll see little bits of salinity on on either sides of the uh, these grid roads that have been built over the years. And it's quite common across the uh, the southern prairies, and in this case, it's partly a result of human activities the way we're farming and and construction of roads to interfere with some groundwater movement. Then there's other types of salinity. In this case, this groundwater would be coming from uh, quite a distance away. It could be uh, five or even 10 kilometers away, uh, coming along above an impermeable layer and then pinching out to where the water table is within a meter or two of the soil surface. It's referred to as outcrop salinity. But in this case, we really don't know exactly where the groundwater is coming from, so we can't really identify the, uh, the recharge area. Uh, another one is coolie bottom salinity. This is a, a common uh, natural form of salinity we see across the prairies in old glacial meltwater channels. And the distance from here to here, the elevation difference might be as much as 100 or even 150 meters. And that salinity is just formed naturally because of natural processes. But then uh, in the upslope positions where the wheat feller rotations were used, uh, adding water to the groundwater, then the salinity problems in some of these coolie bottoms have actually gotten worse, again, because of of human activities. Then the last one I will kind of mention is uh, artesian salinity. This is a diagram from Alberta culture as well. And here in this particular case, we have a confined aquifer. We have an impermeable layer below and above where the groundwater is actually coming from. And so it's actually like a, a pressurized pipe in a sense. So we have enough hydraulic head here. If there's a fracture in this impermeable layer, water will just uh, bubble out from artesian pressure and we'll have salinity develop. And again, it can be very difficult to identify where this water is actually coming from. This is, this, as I mentioned, is a diagram from Alberta Culture and their website uh, showing the discharge area through artesian salinity. This one actually comes from Saskatchewan Air Culture. It was actually originally put together by uh, Les Henry, showing uh, where we actually have a flowing well and then backing up. Uh, you can see where the, uh, the aquifer actually is and the excess water is coming from uh, glacial till soils, water percolating down into the aquifer, and again, uh, we have enough uh, artesian pressure or hydraulic head to actually have flowing wells. And if wells were drilled into this and they're actually flowing, bringing salt along with them, can cause salinity, or in other cases where the water table is closer to these lower areas, causing salinity. And sometimes uh, these distances of the water's traveling can be 10 or 20 kilometers or more. So then it becomes very difficult to identify uh, the recharge area here. It's easy to identify the discharge area, but it's difficult to identify the recharge area. So how can we really identify salinity? Well, I did mention that we can simply take soil samples and uh, send them to the lab for an EC uh, determination. But if you have a, a large area in the field, you really want to know just what areas are affected by salinity or not. To take all the soil samples to do that might actually become fairly uh, cost preventative, but you can actually map salinity on your farm or in individual fields using equipment called an EM38 or a Varus. They can be used to rapidly identify uh, saline soils, and they actually can work uh, fairly well when they're used properly in the field and are properly uh, calibrated. But what you have to do is hire an experienced agronomist or a soil specialist Who's value, who has an, an EM38 or a Varus, uh, to, and then develop an EC map and also a topographic map. And then these, these two maps can be uh, superimposed, uh, give you a very good picture of what's going on. But it is very important to recognize an EM38 or a Varus must be very carefully calibrated to this type of our mapping. So always, if you're going to hire somebody to do this, make sure you ask them, how are you going to calibrate your equipment uh, to develop a very accurate map? This just shows a picture of a uh, Varus. It has uh, disks that run in the soil to uh, measure the, uh, the conductivity or the electromagnetic uh, current. In this particular case, this is a genomic side. I sort of have a preference for the M38 just because I have a lot more experience with the M38. Just by sitting on the soil, you can get a sense of the, uh, the electrical conductivity. And uh, really, for an EM38, it, I, I do like it from the fact that when it's uh, vertical, it's giving you readings in down to 150 centimeters. When it's put on its side, it gives you readings down to 75 centimeters. So we can get uh, our readings in, in uh, two different depths. And to actually look at the electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic inductance, you would set the um, EM38 right on the soil surface. 
uh, puts out the electromagnet and a current. And uh, the more salts in the soil, uh, then the greater the uh, return and, and the, the reading you would pick from the inductance. And just as a reminder, when it's on its side, you can get to 0 to 15 centimeter, sorry, 0 to 75 centimeter uh, depth measurement. And then when it's uh, horizontal, sorry, vertical, it'll give you uh, down to 150 centimeters. And it's very important to, to note though, you're going to measure, uh, give you a good indication of soluble salt, but the more water in the soil here, we had to have hydrogen and hydroxyl ions, which is water. So the more water in the soil, the greater the inductance, uh, soil texture going from a sand to a clay can change the inductance. Uh, if you have uh, frozen soils, that's going to very severely impact uh, measurement. Even if you're wearing steel toe boots, that can affect the inductance. So very, care very, very careful calibration to, to compare uh, what you have in the soil to the readings is very, very important. So just to review then for an EM38, this instrument actually emits an electromagnetic field, which is tra transmitted through the soil. Uh, the instrument receiver measures the intensity of the uh, electromagnetic field. And then with those measurements, by taking soil samples in the field and measuring the actual electrical conductivity in the field and checking soil moisture and texture, then you can develop good correlation maps to show, take these measurements and convert them to EC readings. This is what it would look like if you're actually doing it out in the field. Uh, typically the EM38 would be mounted on a, a sled and that sled would be either made of wood or PVC, can't be made of anything metal. And then um, it'd be a GPS antenna. So uh, then you're collecting the EM38 readings as you're driving across the field. And then with GPS antenna, you know exactly where you are in the field and the elevation. And then there's a data logger uh, up uh, here with the operator recording all the information as you're mapping that field. And once that data is all collected and you've calibrated and you've taken soil samples uh, for correlation, then you can actually develop a, a pretty nice map. This just be an example of a map that uh, was developed by uh, Dr. Shelley Woods in some of her e EC work. And here we've got a, a topography map, so we know the elevation and we also have the soil salinity. So it gives us a superimposed map of salinity and topography on one uh, picture to really give us a good sense of where the problems are. So once we've identified where the problems are, then we have to decide what we're going to do from a reclamation standpoint. And really when it comes to the salts, the only way to get rid of them is to leach them out of the soil. And that means, first of all, if we have a water table, somehow we have to lower that water table. And once the, the water table is lowered, then we can leach those salts from the root zone. But we can't leach them out if we have a high water table. So once the, we can lower that water table, and very slowly with time, precipitation will start to move these salts down. And if you have an irrigation system, that can be done much more rapidly, but most people don't have that option. So then we have to develop, depend on precipitation to be moving these salts downward. And this is a, a, a longer, slow process. And I like to remind people, there's nothing you can spray on the soil to make these soils or make these salts magically disappear. Uh, these salts are there. The only way you can remove them is leaching them back down into the subsoil. There's nothing you can spray on to make them disappear as if by magic. So in terms of how do we get rid of a water table and from a, a cultural standpoint, well, in the these areas here, we have an EC of uh, greater than six. Probably the best bet in the discharge area is to seed a mixture of salt tolerant grasses that would be suitable for your area. And the, the purpose of doing that is to start using up that water and help to try and start to lower that water table. But more important is try to identify where the recharge area is. And if that recharge area is two or three or 400 meters above slope, if you can kind of fairly clearly identify that, probably the best crop to, uh, to establish is alfalfa. Because then we're going to be growing a crop that's going to be greening up in mid-April and growing through till uh, mid and sometimes even late October. So it's constantly using moisture and very little excess moisture is going to be able to move through the road zone when you're growing alfalfa. So over time, that's going to prevent that excess water from moving down to the groundwater. That's going to reduce the amount of water it's in the in, in moving down to the water table and reduce that groundwater flow into this discharge into these discharge areas. So really. Uh, you want to see salt tolerant grasses in the salt affected area and alfalfa in the recharge areas to prevent this excess water. And that's, we just call it cultural controls and it can certainly be uh, fairly effective as long as you can identify or clearly identify uh, the recharge areas. So to get rid of salts then, we have to lower the water table in the discharge area. Uh, 
uh, in the uh, recharge area. We want to prevent excess water from moving down to the groundwater. Then over time, those soluble salts in that discharge area will uh, gradually move down, but it will take a fair amount of time. So if you do have soil salinity and you want to try management, uh, a good starting point is to work with a well-qualified agronomist. Uh, in Alberta, the Alberta government no longer employs anybody that works with farmers to assist them with their salinity, so you'd have to go to a private agronomist. In the province of Saskatchewan, the farmers are quite fortunate. Saskatchewan Agriculture does provide a service to help uh, farmers uh, looking at their salinity problems. And in the state of Montana, they have a, the uh, Montana uh, Salinity Control Association to work with the USDA uh, to help with farmers there. So different areas, depending on where you are, uh, you might have government help. In other cases, you might not have any help at all. But the starting point is to really work with a well-qualified well uh, soil specialist agronomist, whether they're working for the government or, or private industry to work with you. And the first step then is to develop a very good uh, soil salinity map and a very good topography map of the affected areas. One of the other things I'd like to see done is undertake a drilling program to actually install water table wells in where you think the, re the recharge area is and the discharge area is so then you can monitor, monitor the actual water table to see uh, what's going on or you're actually starting to lower it when you're trying to introduce uh, cultural uh, controls. And by doing this, this is going to help you identify the kind of salinity you have. And if you can clearly identify, usually it's always fairly easy to identify with time the discharge area, but if you can clearly identify the recharge area, then you can really start to work on cultural controls to, uh, to turn things around. So in the example, uh, contact slope salinity that I suggested was one of the more common types of salinity in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Uh, the recharge area, typically we would recommend establishing alfalfa or at the very least make sure you're growing uh, crops continuously on your land and uh, preferably longer season crops and higher water use crops, but alfalfa is really the best. And also keep in mind that typically the recharge area is probably gonna be at least four to 10 times the area of your saline seep. And in the discharge area, usually it's best if the ECs are more than, more than six, probably to establish uh, a mixture of salt tolerant grasses to uh, start to use up that water in the discharge areas. And for depression bottom salinity and slurring salinity in the discharge areas, again, establishing the uh, uh, salt tolerant grasses, preferably deeper rooted, somewhere in the range of 30 to 100 meter band around that depression bottom, depending on the size of that discharge area, where the salts are. And then beyond that, maybe seeded in alfalfa in another band, 50 to 100 meters wide in around that area uh, to try and soak up some of that uh, extra groundwater and uh, prevent excess water from moving down to the water table. In other cases, with outcrop salinity, uh, coolie bottom salinity, or artesian salinity, often it's very difficult to really identify uh, the recharge area, and that makes it much more difficult. In some of those cases, your options are really only to uh, establish uh, salt tolerant grasses, perhaps working with the uh, environment department uh, and a number of farmers, you might be able to uh, more clearly identify things. But then that would be collectively a group of farmers having to work together, which is often uh, very difficult to get. Uh, for artesian salinity, sometimes if you actually have flowing wells, you can connect them to a suitable outlet to get them flowing into a surface drain might be one option. But whenever you're going to start with any of these conditions, if you're going to start to play around with improving surface drainage or to consider installing tile subsurface drainage, it's important that you recognize that typically you have to go to your environment department and get a, a development permit or license for your project. It's going to be different, uh, different for each uh, province or state, but it's something that's uh, you have to make sure that you get uh, permission if you're going to start moving water, uh, surface or drainage water, tile drainage water off your land to get to the proper uh, permits or licenses. So just in summary then, um, typically in discharge areas, uh, it's best to grow salt tolerant uh, crops, salt tolerant grasses. And then as you're starting to reclaim those areas and the, and the water tables drop, the salt levels are not as high, then perhaps you could switch to alfalfa in those uh, discharge areas. And then in the recharge areas, first of all, you have to be able to identify them. And then we want to prevent or interrupt that uh, excess water flow to the groundwater to the discharge area. And so seeding the uh, perennial crops like alfalfa in my opinion, in my mind is really the best way to go and do that for a number of years. And then as the program, the, you're starting to improve things then perhaps you can switch uh, seeding the recharge area from alfalfa to uh, move it into continuously cropping uh, with annual crops.
but if you do go back to continuous cropping, that's fine. But you definitely do not want to summer go back to summer following because that's just going to go back to contributing excess water back to the groundwater table again. So the result then, really what you want to do is prevent water from reaching the discharge area. And the best way to do that uh, is to uh, prevent water from moving down to the water table. And, uh, and if you do that, then in the discharge area, hopefully over time, those salts will leach downward and gradually reclaim things. So this, this photo was actually taken by Dr. Paul Brown. He did excellent work with dry land salinity in Montana for many years. This picture was taken about 1975, and he was promoting the growth of alfalfa. Within 20 years, that same field at the same telephone pole, these pictures were provided by him, and uh, that just the, the difference that it made over 20 years, just using very, very good uh, cultural management. And Don Wentz was a uh, dry land salinity specialist with Alberta Culture for a, a number of years. This was a, a field north of Lesbridge, actually it was east of Carmangay. You can see the salt affected areas here. And he worked in his particular farm, was owned by uh, Ron Spain, he still farms up there. And uh, 20 years later, with using uh, cultural controls, you can see the, the trees in the background here. These are the same trees here. And 20 years later, was able to bring that back into production. So certainly, if we can identify the, the recharge areas and, and handle them appropriately, it's amazing how we can kind of turn things around. It's time consuming and it takes a lot of work, but it certainly uh, uh, can be very successful. Now, I did mention uh, subsurface tile drainage. Uh, it can be used in cases where you can't clearly identify the recharge area. You can use subsurface tile drainage to control salinity. Um, and you can use these tile drains for the excess salts to be flushed out of the soil, uh, preferably using irrigation. That's where they work best, but you can use natural precipitation over time. And before I moved into my research position in the early 1980s, I was actually the irrigation specialist in Westbridge, and one of the things I did is that job was doing subsurface tile drainage design. So I'm quite familiar with, with uh, still how to do it. But the problem how with tile drainage though is you do have to get uh, approval from your uh, Ministry of the Environment. And we always have to ask ourselves, we're gonna put in tile drainage, what kind of problems are we gonna create downslope or downstream uh, where those excess of water and salts are gonna go? So we really have to um, be concerned because we're not addressing the excess water problem, we're just shifting that problem uh, somewhere else. So it's always the concern with, with tile drainage. But if you're gonna do it, you want to make sure you do it right. First of all, it means a site investigation. I talked about the EM38 uh, and doing a topographic survey so you have good soil and topographic information. You really should be doing some uh, drilling, installing water table wells to see where the water tables are. And um, you also have to identify an outlet where you can actually drain that raw water away by gravity. So once that invest site investigation is done, then you can do the drainage design, but you need to have important information like the soil hydraulic conductivity. There's definite formulas you need to use to decide how deep to put those tile drains and, and the, um, the width of those drains. So it must be properly designed, then finally must be properly installed. And I always look at tile drainage as kind of something of a last resort, but you can do it and, it and it can work and work very successfully. If it's investigated, designed and installed uh, correctly, it can give you very good salinity control. Uh, typically, there's laterals to collect the excess water and salt, then there's a, a main drain to dispose of the salt and then have some sort of outlet where that water drained into a, uh, a drain or a natural drain or, or a water course to dispose of the excess water. And for drainage to work, you must have sufficient slope uh, for that water to move uh, by gravity. Just some examples of where you might lay them out. In this particular case, we might have a couple of spots in the field where we have, have some laterals going through at the correct space and depth. And then we have the, the main drains to collect that water to drain away to the outlet. Uh, these dot dash lines here just show the elevation. And here we have um, tile drains in, installed in a, in a grid design. So the laterals are a solid grid design, and there's a main drain to move this water away to, to the outlet. In this particular case, these are the topographic lines, and uh, so the, the drainage tile drains are actually installed. Uh, the laterals are installed in a herringbone design, and then a main drain to drain out excess waterway. So there's various ways that things can be designed depending on uh, the situation. The old clay tiles were used back in the early 70s. I even recall installing some tile drainage like this uh, in the early 70s, but really from the late 70s on, we've used plastic tile drain. It's very important if you're gonna use it to make sure it has a, lime, a nylon stock, stocking over top of it to prevent sediment moving into the line to plug it up. If you don't put these, these this nylon sock on, then it could quite easily plug up and then uh, you spend a lot of money and for a system that just simply is not gonna work. Like I mentioned, the outlet 
is really the most critical. Where are you going to actually uh, discharge that uh, excess water? Will it be in a constructed drain, uh, natural drainage course? And it's very, very important you have permission to do that. So I look at your drainage water will contain uh, salts and nutrients such as nitrates, sulfates, and chlorides. And these can be a serious environmental concern. If we're gonna be dumping this back into surface waters, we really have to ask ourselves, how will that subsurface drainage water affect your downslope neighbors and downstream water users? That's something you really need to uh, identify very carefully uh, before you go ahead with uh, subsurface tile drainage. So uh, that's pretty much wrapping up th things from my standpoint, but I do want to point out that Alberta agriculture, Saskatchewan agriculture, Manitoba agriculture all have excellent information on their website. So definitely go to see that because I've just given you a 45 or 50 minutes, a very brief introduction to salinity. These websites go into a lot more uh, detailed information. Uh, Montana Dryland Salinity Control Association has excellent information on their site. And really those of us in Alberta really learned a lot from um, what went on in Montana in the 1970s and 80s and uh, helped to adopt a lot of things uh, in Alberta when uh, we had salinity problems in Alberta. Unfortunately, we don't have anybody to uh, go to in the government uh, with assistance, but um, some of the other uh, places do. But definitely there are some very good sources of information. And maybe I'll just turn it back to uh, uh, Janine for a uh, uh, comment. Perfect. Um, thank you so much, Ross. There's lots of fantastic information here. Um, before we get to our question period, um, Top Crop would just like to once again thank Bioagronics for sponsoring this session of our webinar series. Um, please be sure to visit topcropmanager.com slash webinars to see the other sessions coming up. We have uh, one per month until April um, and more will be announced soon. So Ross, um, I just wanted to ask, um, I believe this wasn't covered in your presentation. Um, can you explain a bit about why um, it takes so long for saline soils to develop? Well, really the, the main reason is that it really comes down to a groundwater movement situation. And so uh, for a discharge area to develop, it takes a lot of time for that excess water, a few inches a year, moving down to the groundwater, developing a groundwater table, and then that water flowing to uh, the, uh, the discharge area. And that period of time for that, that water to move, salts to be dissolved, and that salts to move, uh, I can really take a number of years. It could take uh, 20, 40, even 60 years, depending on how far that water has to move, how quickly or how slowly that water is moving, and then for that salinity to gradually develop where that, that uh, water is moving and wicking up or moving my capillary rise up into the root zone, that water evaporating and leaving salts behind. It's a long, slow process, and, and to say it takes 40 to 60 years for salinity to really uh, develop is really not an understatement. That's uh, quite true. It can take a long time. And by the same token, when you're using cultural practices to control salinity, it can uh, be similar. It can take upwards of 20 years to, to really lower that water table and then natural precipitation to move that salt, uh, salt back down. And maybe I will just uh, put that, that was the, the kind of the last slide I really had. I just really wanted to point out that from a salinity standpoint, uh, we've learned a lot about salinity after the, uh, over the last 40 years, and we really need to learn a lot more to, in terms of learning how to manage our land, our water, our cropping systems to be more sustainable and just had a picture of an old tractor stuck in a saline seat. So we've, got a, we've learned a lot, but I think there's a, a lot more we actually have to learn. And just for the viewers, uh, just to remind you, my name is Ross McKenzie, but more importantly, I, and I do that so I can remember who I am when I'm old and I'm forgetful, but um, I thought I'd just give you my phone number and my email address, and I rarely Twitter, uh, but I do have a Twitter account, and uh, so I thought I'd just give that information to, to the viewers. If you ever want, have any questions, I certainly encourage you to talk to your, provin your provincial or state uh, people for more detailed information, but if you ever have a question, you want to give me a phone call, uh, feel free. The temperature in Lethbridge is plus 11, so I'm not on in the mountain skiing right now, so you can feel free to call me today. But as soon as the mountains have snow, then I'm going to be back out skiing again. But uh, feel free to call me if you ever have any uh, questions. You just want an unbiased uh, third opinion. Perfect. Um, so I do have a couple more questions from our viewers. Um, one is um, the unit of measurement in our soil tests are all in uh, MMHO per centimeter. How do those units align? Is one unit more common than the other? Well, typically the, the metric unit that we use is a uh, deci siemens per meter. Uh, the old units that we used to use were uh, millimoles per centimeter. And fortunately, 
those numbers don't change. So uh, the, even though the units change, uh, an EC of two uh, millimoles per uh, centimeter or uh, deci siemens per meter uh, are the same. So in that case, uh, you're okay. It's where you start running into uh, other units and we have to make sure we get them converted over to deci siemens per meter for correct interpretation. Um, another one here, uh, if you try to reclaim a saline sodic soil with improved drainage and leaching, will it turn into a sodic soil as it desalinizes? Uh, that's that's a whole different ballgame. When you have both a saline soil and a sodic soil, uh, you, typically a, a sodic soil is um, high in sodium and you have very poor drainage anyway. Uh, but if you're able to start moving salts downward uh, to relieve the... Uh, uh, soil salinity situation, you're still left with a sodium problem. And uh, that's when in uh, that one uh, publication I referred to, management of sodic soils, really what you have then have to do with a sodic soil, if it's high in sodium, then you do have to add some sort of an amendment. Typically, we would recommend uh, gypsum. There's actually a formula we actually have in that uh, publication I, that I referred to. And when you know your uh, SIR and other detailed information, you can calculate how much gypsum you would actually have to apply to your soil. And then what happens is that this, uh, the sodium is kicked off the exchange complex by calcium. Uh, sodium has one plus charge, calcium has two plus charges. So then um, by adding enough uh, gypsum, uh, with it contains the, the calcium that'll kick off the sodium off the exchange complex and start to improve the, the sodic aspect of that soil. But it is a, uh, when you have, do have a, a saline sodic soil, that's a very tricky uh, situation to manage. And a, an old friend of mine from Saskatchewan once said, if you have a saline so sodic soil, the best thing to do is wait for winter and you have a nice uh, snow cover, then put up a for sale sign. That's the best way to manage it. But to, to, to truly manage it though, is a bit of a challenge. Perfect. Um, another question here, um, we have some soil zones with sodium parts per million of 250 to 1,000. Uh, EC is showing less than 1.5 decisiemens per meter. Um, always thought these zones were saline. By your definition, they are not. How would you manage these types of soil? Uh, that's a little a little different situation. I think what I'd want to do is then go back to uh, lab analysis and make sure we either have a exchangeable sodium percentage or uh, preferably uh, SIR, the sodium absorption ratio, because then we can see the amount of uh, uh, sodium on exchange complex compared to calcium and magnesium and then decide how to manage that soil. But technically, if the EC is one and then it looks like it has a higher sodium level, it really it would initially appear to be more of a, a sodic a soil problem, which would have to be handled differently. And it might mean an, an amendment uh, using something like uh, gypsum. And uh, so there again, probably the best thing to do would be uh, go back to the lab and, and get them to determine either exchangeable uh, sodium or preferably SAR, sodium absorption ratio, and then you can start doing some, uh, uh, clearly identify it is a sodic problem, and then go from there in terms of managing it with uh, perhaps some amendments like, like uh, gypsum. Perfect. Um, just another question about tillage. Um, does deep tillage improve yields in saline soil? Well, if you have a high water table going in and doing the uh, deep ripping or deep tilling uh, usually will, will make will make no difference. It might help to maybe dry the soil surface out, but your problem is the high water table. And uh, doing deep tillage is not going to do anything to uh, alleviate the, the groundwater problem, which is really the, the main factor for having the saline soil. So deep tillage usually will not do, uh, will do little if anything to uh, improve things unless you're able to lower that water table uh, then you do some deep tillage to try and improve the, the water movement or deep percolation through that salt affected soil. But you have to lower the water table first before it would have any benefit. Perfect. Um, this is probably going to be our last question as we're running out of time. Um, on high sodium soil, is there much concern of over application of gypsum? Um, well, to be honest, if you put on a little bit too much, it's probably not going to have an impact. But uh, too much of anything is not beneficial. Uh, so I would have to say uh, the best thing to do is make sure you take your soil samples and to have SAR determined, make sure you know the characteristics of the soil. And then the, uh, that one publication I referred to, Management of Sodic Soils in Alberta, there is a formula in there uh, working with an agronomist. You can actually calculate the correct application rate uh, 
of gypsum so then you're, then you're going to be fairly assured you're not going to be over applying the, the gypsum. Perfect. Okay, um, that looks like that concludes our second session of our webinar series. Um, thank you again, Ross, for presenting. Um, I just want to remind everyone that, again, you will receive an email approximately 24 hours um, from the live broadcast. Um, just of a recording so you can go back through um, Ross's presentation and again um, you can let him know if you have any other questions. Um, there will also be further instructions on how to apply for the credits available. Thank you everyone.